things that this great lie about human caused global warming or climate change as they called it after the temperatures started falling year after year um, and uh, it's uh, uh, an example of something that I call no problem reaction solution yes, you know you, you, you can you can you can create a problem a real one like like a terrorist attack which you do, you set up and blame some terrorists for or you can uh, create a, a global economic crash which then you can offer your solutions for which is changing the structure of global finance in the way you want um, and you can create wars which of course are, are big problems and the solution is uh, to advance this agenda of more and more conquest of countries like Libya, we've just we're seeing now, and uh, and uh, the uh, the changing of the face of the, the the way that the world's controlled politically and all the rest of it. But often you don't need a real problem. I mean, look at um, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Uh, all that was justified. All that massive loss of life and maiming of people uh, f f for life including untold numbers of children was justified by a problem that didn't exist they made it up and this is what's happening with global uh, uh, warming quote mm. uh, they are making up the problem they're using a front man or have up to this point called Al Gore though he seems to have gone absent without leave since the massive revelations of the emails that the Climate Center at a, a, a British uh, university uh, that showed gate. that they that yeah a climate gate showed that they were they were fixing the the uh, data to make it look like uh, something was happening when it wasn't now I mean he's, I, I'm I'm getting worried for him Lisa I mean I've not heard him I've not heard him lie for ages because I've not seen him uh, of course if I saw him and his lips were moving he would be lying because no, it's exactly. Al Gore um, so this is a man that had one of the biggest carbon footprints on the planet Godzilla he's got the carbon footprint of Godzilla that man hmm. um, and and you have all these people uh, flying to climate conferences in private jets I mean the, the, the ones at the core of this they know it's a nonsense and of course there are now scientists I think I, I saw one f from Australia a few uh, uh, months ago who was a, a climate change you know kind of groupie uh, who's come out and said no actually it's a load of rubbish and and um, the thing is that if you if you make what you want to happen and what you want to be said very financially beneficial for people mm. like um, you you throw limitless amounts of money at research into climate change or global warming all these buddy scientists are making a fortune out of researching climate change and and all the rest of it now two things one for them to come out and say uh, no it's a load of rubbish uh, which they they 90 odd percent of them must know because it, 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 it's child's play um, would mean that they're actually giving up all this funding so there's a massive financial uh, um, encouragement to keep parroting the party line well don't we um, also have people like Al Gore and his mates and I think even those in British government uh, either shareholders in companies or somehow associated with companies financially that are now set up to sell carbon uh, vouchers, so to speak, for companies right. to buy them from. So, you, I mean, there's money's going around and around and around, and um, we're paying for it with carbon tax. Y yes, and uh, Al Gore um, set up a, a company uh, which operates through the city of London with a man called Blood from uh, former uh, executive of Goldman Sachs it's known as blood and gore very appropriately in the city <laughs> of London apparently and and that has interests uh, considerable interests in 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 this whole carbon trading system and it's a scam um, and they've created it um, not not just to create a lot of money for themselves but that that's always uh, part of the deal whenever they do anything but it, it's also to justify a tremendous number of things that wouldn't be justified otherwise not just carbon taxation which is which is squeezing the people even more um, but justifying things like 
smart meters and smart grids which, 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 for which there are fundamental implications uh, in terms of human control. Uh, it, it's justifying uh, the authorities messing in the fine detail of our of our lives you can't do this you can't do that and and we must be uh, allowed to come into your home and see that you're you know energy uh, efficient and all the other stuff and 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 also i mean and this sounds on the face of it lisa like a small thing but i i've got a book coming out in uh, in in january I, i've been writing it uh, about 15 hours a day all summer because I had a really tight deadline before I headed for Australia and uh, I go into this in some in some detail uh, what I'm talking about are these light bulbs um, mm. I mean it's a, the, the question is this or, or, or the point is this this is a real red flag and a real alarm bell when something is so ludicrous so ridiculous uh, and so obviously so yet they still push on with it then you know it's the agenda and if it's the agenda of this global network then it's seriously not good for humanity and when you look at these uh, light bulbs these so-called energy efficient light bulbs or apparently if you turn them on and off too much they're less efficient than uh, the, the ones we've had up to this point, which have been fine. And what you take, what you do, it's funny, you know, I've noticed this in my life. What you tend to do with lights is turn them on and off, you know. <laughs> um, so um, you look at the, a situation where everything was fine. We had the, the, the light bulbs we've uh, become associated with, etc. When one of those uh, light bulbs broke, uh, what you did, uh, there was no drama is you got a dustpan and brush and you sweeped up the glass and stuff and you put it in the bin and you put another light bulb in that that's very straightforward it takes a few seconds well if you could see the instructions from government authorities for what you have to do if one of these things breaks one of these uh, so-called energy efficient light bulbs because they have mercury in them yes and we've, we've increasingly re removed mercury from things like thermometers and other things because because the, the mercury was dangerous um, and and so we say okay we've done that because it's dangerous so what are you gonna do next we're gonna have mercury in all the light bulbs in all the houses in all the world and that's and 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 it's it's just incredible when you see what you have to do basically what the authorities are saying is if you um, uh, break one of these light bulbs then basically you, you, a, anything short of abandon the property um, one woman in America, or I quote in the book, um, she uh, broke one of these light bulbs, or one of the light bulbs broke, in her daughter's bedroom. She then calls the store that she bought them from, and, 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 and they said, oh, well, um, ring, ring the, this, you know, kind of emergency number uh, with the state. She rings that, and she's told to contact a company to come and make the house safe. So this company turns up, one light bulb has broken, and it cost her $2,000 to clean up, and her daughter couldn't use the, her, her room for ages. That's one. Now, in America, um, they uh, have billions of these light bulbs um, being used, or, or billions of light bulbs are being used. Uh, let's start at that stage. And now, as with other parts of the world, in, in the European Union now, these uh, light bulbs that we had before are banned. Um, America wants to do the same, start pushing in through 2012 and, and, and Canada, and I know it's, it's going on in, in, in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and then you ask, um, where are these bulbs going to go? These billions and billions and billions of mercury infested light bulbs where are they going to go when they wear out where are they going to go the authorities say you have to dispose of them in a certain way well are people going to do that or mass of course they're not they're going to end up in tips and the tips are going to become infested with vast amounts of, of, of mercury and and it's going to eventually get into the the drinking water in some places in the groundwater in some places and so you look at this lisa and you say this is insane hmm. but not only are they encouraging people 
to do this, they're imposing it by law. You do not have an alternative to this because we're banning the alternative. Now, when they do that, you know that these light bulbs are fundamentally important to their um, to their gain, to what they want. Mm. Because when the absurd is imposed upon people, it, it's it's um, it, it's a, a great cover that they use, and it's called bureaucratic incompetence. Now, does that exist? Yes, it does. Does it exist at the level of this? Uh, agenda, this network um, that is actually uh, generating these changes in society. No, it doesn't. But it's a good way to hide cold calculation, and that's what we're dealing with here. And and you know what I've um, what I've uncovered in, in written in the new book uh, in some detail is the connection between smart grids and smart meters, and uh, which I know there's a lot of controversy about them in America too, and uh, in uh, Australia rather. And, yeah. uh, but but I, I, it wasn't really a slip of the tongue because there's a tremendous amount of, of uh, opposition to them going on in America now, particularly in California. Then uh, the, the uh, here we go again, Lisa. Right, um, the European Union wants. Uh, the vast majority of Europe to be have these smart meter and, and smart grids by 2020. Again, the world is moving as one unit on the light bulbs. It's moving as one unit on the smart grids and the smart meter, or the smart grid globally as it's designed to be eventually. And, and so when that happens, what you're looking at is is the the family bloodline stroke. Um, secret society, a global transnational corporation at work, uh, and this is how it works. Um, uh, over the years, I've I've uncovered how a uh, a group of interbreeding bloodlines have emerged from the ancient world. They uh, were the uh, the aristocracy and the royal families of the ancient world, all, all over the place, um, and they uh, gr a great and, and um, very significant group of them moved up into Europe, where they became the European royal families and um, and the aristocracy. And then, when the people started uh, resisting uh, uh, this blatant, in-your-face royal dictatorship that, that was imposed in country after country, then these bloodlines had to change tack and they moved into what I call the dark suit professions of banking and business and politics and all the rest of it. And through the, uh, uh, very relevant to Australia and New Zealand, through the so-called Great British Empire um, and, and other European empires, these uh, bloodlines were exported all around the world to to Australia, New Zealand, uh, Africa, or uh, met the Amer Americas. And then came this um, sleight of hand, which uh, is called uh, giving the colonies their freedom. And there's two types of control. One you can see touch and taste, communism, fascism, apartheid, where the people under that tyranny have a, a, some kind of fix, so they can't see the people in the shadows, but they can see the people in the public arena dictating their lives. Um, and that kind of dictatorship can only go on for a certain amount of time. It can go on for quite a long time, but it has a finite life for a simple reason. The people enslaved by that tyranny know they're enslaved in a tyranny, and therefore they if you like, they're sitting in a, in a prison cell and they can see the bars. The, the greatest form of control, which is what happened after the, uh, uh, the colonialists apparently left uh, places like Australia and America, is the prison without the bars that you can see. Um, uh, what we call democracy. Uh, I mean, democracy is, is equated with, with freedom. I love it. A democracy, let's take us through that. You have a vote every four or five years uh, for people who t told you that if you vote for me, they'll do this. Um, but there's no contract, therefore they have no obligation whatsoever to, um, to do in office what they told you they would do to get your vote. So they then go into power and they do as they bloody like. And then there's a farce called an election where sometimes the people in the government change, but the people behind the people in the government don't change. The hidden hand doesn't change, and therefore nothing changes in terms of the policy. The same agenda is followed whichever party is in power. That's why uh, in, informed people in America talk not about the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, they talk about the Republicrats, because it's a single party. That's what you find in, in every uh, country, virtually, if you, if you go into the shadows uh, a, a few steps. Um, and so... Um, what happened uh, when the colonial powers 
apparently withdrew, is they left out in those countries, including Australia and New Zealand, the bloodlines under different names, their interbreeding families under different names, and the secret society network which manipulates those people and their agents into the positions of power in these countries. And what uh, they've constructed, uh, which is how all this stuff relating to smart grids and global warming and all the rest of it can be can move as one unit is they've created the global equivalent of a secret of a not what well, it is a secret society network but the global equivalent of a transnational corporation if you take something like McDonald's they have a headquarters uh, somewhere in the world America and then in every country they have subsidiaries and those subsidiaries in each country carry out the diktat of the headquarters. So if you go into a McDonald's, if you must, um, uh, in uh, Moscow or Sydney or, or New York or South Africa, you're basically going into the same McDonald's. Yes. Now, what this global secret society transnational corporation does is, is basically the same. You have the headquarters, what I call the spider, that's in Europe uh, for historical reasons. It's also in America to an extent extent but so often that the America is is uh, given the gun but the bullets are, are you know put in the gun in Europe and America is asked to fire it or told to fire it <clears throat> and so all eyes are on uh, America when actually the real center of this web is in Europe at operational level and then <clears throat> in each country you've got the subsidiary network of families and secret societies and their job is to impose in their sphere of influence their country the agenda dictated by the spider at the center of the web and in this way the same things can be introduced at almost the same time all over the world and not only that the uh, national subsidiary of families and secret societies also has subsidiaries in the cities and the regions of of the country and so it's it's possible through this structure for the spider at the center of the web to dictate right the way through into a country and then down into the community within a country and this is how it works and this is why you're seeing the smart grids and the smart meters and the light bulbs being introduced in country after country after country in the same way based on the same lie because people like Al Gore I've learned many things in the last 21 years of research, but one of them certainly is that if Al Gore's involved, it's a scam, because Al Gore is um, an agent for the spider, if you like. And that's why in 2000, when uh, Boy Bush was blatantly uh, scammed into the presidency with all that went on in Florida, um, Gore, in effect, compared with what he, a genuine person would have done, he basically walked away because he knew that it was Bush's um, uh, uh, destiny because of the the way the manipulation was was not only done, but it was decided long ago that Boyd Bush would be the president in that period, that he, he needed to walk away because it wasn't his job. He was just there to, 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 to have the farce of apparent debate in an election to kid the American people. They live in a free country. He knew that his job in this whole thing was coming up and it was going to be about global warming. He did. He acted um, like a child who was having a bit of a sock. I'm going to take my bat and ball and go home. Yeah, but I mean... He should have caused an absolute storm because it was so blatant. And eventually, of course, the decision to make Bush president was done by the Supreme Court, which had a Republican Party majority. Um, so uh, this is the thing. When I uh, look at any country, and I look at Australia, um, I see the same things, uh, Lisa. I see uh, John Howard pursuing uh, a certain policy with regard to using uh, uh, Australian troops in wars that, that, that they should have nothing to do with. I see, I see the way that they... Uh, push the agenda on for more and more control, more and more attacks on small business, because they don't want small business or small farms. They want corporations running the whole thing. That's why you've got all, all these, these financial and uh, um, uh, attacks and all this uh, bureau bureaucratic 
uh, nightmare that's going on for small business and small farmers and all the rest of it. It's systematic. It's going on in Australia. It's going on in America. It's going on everywhere. Uh, they want the land too. They want people off the land. Part of this whole uh, global warming lie is something known as Agenda 21, which is an operation uh, orchestrated through the um, United Nations, which, to which country after country after country, the uh, best part of 200 worldwide, are all uh, connected to this, signed up for this. And they've produced the maps uh, under something called biodiversity uh, of America in the, in the in the new brave new world and and vast vast tracts of America um, are, are on this map banned from any human activity humans can't go there mm. um, it's incredible I mean that have to reduce the population by absolute dramatic numbers for any of this to happen but then that's the plan when you see when you see this when you see this and then you see things unfold um, you can see what's happening. For instance, um, most blatant, what they want, they want all the productive farmland because they want it to go to corporations uh, that they own, like Monsanto and these other big food corporations, just a few of them, that virtually control the global uh, food chain uh, now. They want rid of everybody else and they want their land and they want to ban them from producing food one of the ways they're going to do it is by, and they're doing it already is by saying it's not safe and, unless it's done a certain way and that certain way can only be done by corporations but you know um, uh, f uh, this summer um, the Missouri and Mississippi rivers uh, were, were very very uh, heavily uh, f f you know bursting the banks um, because of uh, weather conditions that happened, there was m much bigger snowfall and a lot of rain, all the rest of it. Well, um, you might have seen on the news that the uh, um, American uh, Corps of Engineers uh, came along and said, um, we have to um, explode some of the levees to um, release the volume of water so it protects people further down the river. Well, what they did is... Um, uh, blow levees which flooded incredible amounts of, of, of prime farmland all the way down the rivers um, and of course it destroyed all the crops of the small farmers because the, the overwhelming that's what it was and 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 the the, the people had to leave their homes because the, 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 the rate of the flooding because of what the Corps of Engineers did uh, literally literally a few weeks later um, these farmers um, and landowners um, and property owners got letters offering to buy the land from the government to buy the land through the Corps of Engineers that had blown the levees and caused all this problem. Um, and, you know, uh, that, uh, this is going on all the time. People like George Soros, you know, when like Tony Blair, like Julia Gillard, like um, George Soros, uh, uh, David Rockefeller, all these people, when they are Barack Obama, when they open their mouths, it is the cabal talking, not them. Um, and uh, George Soros, um, as suddenly this billionaire financier who attacks uh, governments uh, or countries' uh, currencies and causes mayhem uh, on purpose, uh, he has been uh, buying up um, not just farmland, but uh, the ability to produce food uh, uh, technology and companies and at an absolute rate of not at the same time that all this is going on. So, uh, and this is a global thing, so if it's not hit Australia yet, it, 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 it will if we uh, don't do something about all this, because it's a global agenda to get people off the vast majority of land on the planet and into very uh, tightly populated uh, like cities, skyscraper cities. This is not me making up. This is in, in their own writings. So, and, and it's all based. It's all founded. The whole thing. Smart grids, smart meters. Uh, these uh, uh, lights, which also, by the way, give off uh, radiation and dangerous chemicals. Absolutely established by scientists it does that. This is why so many people feel ill when they're in among the lights. One scientist said, 
if you've got so and so and so and so, you shouldn't be, uh, you shouldn't have um, have these lights. And you're thinking, well, that's fair enough. But the government's saying they're you've got to have them because there's no alternative. What are they going to do? Sit in the dark? I you mean, can't actually buy them. You can, it's very difficult to actually buy normal light globes now here in Australia. You've got to go to specialist hardware stores that, and things like that. That's the idea. In Europe, in Europe, Lisa, it's banned. It's banned already. You can't. You can't. You can't buy them, uh, and it's it's illegal to import them. I mean, it's unbelievable. So there's that. Then there's all this stuff, uh, Agenda 21, and and, and uh, the agenda for the land and all the rest of it. Um, uh, and then there's the carbon trading, and, all that. and it's all based, it's all justified on a massive, provable lie, i.e., that humans are affecting the temperature of the planet. If you could see, what what I do when I, I come to Australia, I put a, I put a graphic on the screen, a graph of greenhouse gases and on the left is a massive massive chunk it's about ninety seven eight percent of greenhouse gases and I say well according to the propaganda that must be carbon dioxide it must be but it ain't it's water, water vapor, vapor and clouds <laughs> and yeah. what are we gonna do ban condensation I mean well, let's, let's legislate against condensation. Um, and then next to it is, is a tiny little uh, block, which is um, carbon dioxide. And the vast, overwhelming majority of that block is naturally uh, generating carbon dioxide. There's only a little sliver at the top, um, uh, almost you know, imperceivable, that is actually what humans put into the atmosphere. Uh, and it's a lie, and and it's it's it's. Um, have you noticed too? This is an, another thing. Not only do they um, push on with things that are clearly ludicrous, there you know it's the agenda. Then, but also when all the evidence comes out, scientists, climate gate, all this stuff that shows that it's a scam, they just keep walking. They just ignore it. They absolutely like, ignore it. It just it stops it totally being on the news. It. it stops being mentioned in any of the media. It's just as if the whole thing went away. But the pro yes, that it just marches on. It's just not in the headlines anymore. And that's when you also know that it's the agenda. I mean, th there was a um, a very well known newsreader in this country. Um, called Peter Sissons. He was um, a, a, a national main, uh, you know, mainstream uh, primetime news presenter for like decades on various major channels. And he worked for the last 20 years of his career for the BBC. And he came out in his, um, what they call it, memoirs, very grandly, um, and uh, said that <laughs> the BBC News um, had a, a, a strict editorial policy that g global warming caused by humans was fact and anything challenging that was not fact and therefore should be not um, talked about. And he interviewed um, the, the national, one of the national spokespeople for the British Green Party um, who, who was talking nonsense about uh, this whole global warming thing. One of the things she said in one interview was, "This is a, a national security issue." <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> yes, I'm not kidding you. Anyway, in this interview, all he said was, "But the, the climate doesn't seem to be playing ball with your thesis, does it? Because the temperatures are falling." And she said to him on air, words to the effect of, "I, I, I it's audacious that you should." bring that up on the BBC, or you should say that on the BBC. It's actually be true. And Sisson says in his book that this uh, little interchange went right up to the upper echelons of the BBC where his conduct was discussed um, for actually asking a, a clearly blatantly re relevant question um, of, what, of one of these climate propaganda uh, agents from the you know, the new church of climatology, which is the high priest is, uh, of course, Al Gore. And so this is what's going on. And in many ways, what we're talking about here, very, very relevant to Australia. I, I can see that from the, what I've been reading recently. Um, but it's also a microcosm of the macrocosm. It's, it's, it's an expression of the way the blueprint works uh, over everything, whether it's 9-11, banking scams, whatever it is, Libya, 
It is lie, 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 and, and, and the media takes the lie and reports it as truth, and there's nothing more powerful in uh, uh, making a lie seem real than to keep repeating it. I mean, Hitler talked about that. You know, make the lie uh, simple uh, and keep saying it is basically his idea of propaganda. And it works if people don't think for themselves and question. And then um, uh, anyone that's challenging the lie, they are marginalized as, as kind of crazy freaks, conspiracy theorists. Conspiracy theories, that, that's now a, 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 a term of mockery and indeed a, a, a term of, of uh, an unpleasant label. Oh, this, this person's a conspiracy theorist. Oh, yes, and you're a coincidence theorist, aren't you? You think it's all a coincidence when it's all blatantly happening at the same time in country after country. But the word conspiracy so, uh, now goes hand in hand with the word theory. The time. Sorry, Lisa. Oh, sorry, we're talking over each other for a second. Um, yeah, the word conspiracy and the word theory now just go hand in hand. Um, people can't see beyond theory and see that it's fact. Conspiracy yeah, fact. That's right, absolutely. I've said that in previous books years and years ago, fully enough, that humans seem to have a genetic inability to say the word conspiracy without saying fa um, uh, theory, theory after it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like, it's like, say conspiracy, conspiracy, theory. Oh, see, oh, oh <laughs> stop myself, can't stop myself. Yeah, and it is, and, and this is this is calculated. You you fuse the words together. So, for instance, um, what what the media does? Because you know, I worked in the mainstream media for years, uh, and if anyone could see uh, the average mainstream media newsroom in whatever media vehicle it is, they'd never believe another word they ever heard on the media, really. Um, and um, some of the most um, uh, shall we say uh, mentally challenged people um, I, I have, I've met have been have been journalists and uh, both who I work with and seen since um, but what happens is they um, eventually establish it was in my books for years before that that the whole thing about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq um, was a lie, a, a calculated lie to justify the invasion. Okay, fine, okay, they got there eventually, or some of them did. But then, the same people who have been exposed as calculatingly uh, lying to justify the invasion of Iraq, they then start talking about global warming or the need to invade Libya, and the media just starts taking what they say as fact again. Mm. Um, and it's, it's, I mean, it's like, is there anyone home? I can't see any evidence of it. Uh, and, you know, this is a, a really big key because, like, like I, I just mentioned, that there's a technique that I've been calling for a long time, problem reaction solution or no problem reaction solution. You create a problem covertly. Uh, terrorist uh, attack, uh, government collapse, uh, financial collapse, whatever. You then um, tell an unquestioning, uh, uh, through an unquestioning media, you tell the public the version of that problem and the manufactured villains or what is responsible for that problem, you, you tell that to the people. And at stage two, you're looking for the reaction to the problem, and that is something must be done, what are they going to do about it? Um, then those who've... Um, covertly created the problem and got that reaction do something uh, they then offer openly in changes in society and legislation solutions to the problems they've created and they are solutions that without the problem they would have had massive opposition from the public about mm. now the key area in this this is where I'm going with this is the communication uh, by the forces that have covertly created the problem um, to the people of the fake um, cause of the problem. And that is the mainstream media's job. If we had even passing, a passing reference to real journalism in the mainstream media, this key mass ma manipulation technique, problem, reaction, solution, could not work it would fall at you know first base or second base anyway the point where 
Um, those that covertly created the problem are communicating their fake explanation to the public. Journalists, real journalists, would, would, would look at it, they would investigate it, they would check it out, they'd see if it stood up, they'd see if it was true, and they'd find, as people like me and so many others around the world do in the so-called alternative uh, uh, media, you find that it, the official explanations are a nonsense and a blatantly uh, manufactured fairy tale. Uh, that you would then communicate that to the public, and problem reaction solution is gone. It's broken down. It's collapsed. It's, they don't get to the solution uh, stage. But because we have a media that is little more than the public relations office for the official version of everything. Um, then problem reaction solution works absolutely uh, brilliantly, uh, and, and we've just seen an example of that in um, in Libya, where uh, they followed the, the the blueprint of invasion, demonize uh, a, a leader or demonize a regime. Maybe maybe uh, sometimes like with Mubarak in Egypt, that is justified. Uh, but then there's the little rider to that, that you who are demonizing Mubarak have been arming and funding him for the last 30 years. Now suddenly the guy you've kept in power and given the means to impose his tyranny upon upon the Egyptian people, now you're suddenly the, 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 the calling for freedom for the Egyptian people. And what's happening in the Middle East and North Africa is we are stepping towards World War Three. In fact, we're already in World War Three. It's just not been officially declared. Mm. World War Three began on September the 11th, uh, 2001, and so far it's involved uh, Afghanistan, um, Iraq, uh, Libya. They're, they're now. Um, killing thousands uh, by uh, unmanned uh, drone bombing of Pakistan and, and, and Yemen and, and, and Somalia and all these things. We're involved in World War Three. It's just not been declared. And I, I've said in the mid-90s in my books that this was coming, cause, not because I'm a prophet or, or some genius, but if you, if you, if you can find uh, the, uh, the evidence of where these people want the world to go, then you can predict pretty much the future, because unless something intervenes in where they want it to go, it's going to play out, and it is. Um, and um, what, um, what they want is a third world war, which will officially break out in the Middle East, this is the plan, involving Israel and Arab countries, and they want to bring in uh, Europe and North America, and I'm sure whether it's Gillard or whoever follows, her, oh yes, Australian troops need to go and support our allies and all that stuff, usual stuff, yeah. and and they want to bring that those that that in that group in against Russia and China. I've been saying it since the mid 90s, and what you're seeing now um, is and I've seen for some, some years, is the emergence of China. But you're also seeing now, in the last few weeks even, the way China and Russia are getting closer and closer. They, they, you had the, uh, the, the uh, head of the so-called People's Liberation Army in China uh, saying that um, you know, there has to be much greater... Uh, cooperation and joint operations between Russia and, and Chinese uh, militaries. And you're also now, with what's happening in the Middle East, starting to generate um, uh, increasing hostility, to, well, I mean like physical hostility towards, towards Israel. <coughs> and um, my goodness me, uh, Israel uh, is is massively involved in this. Not the Israeli people in general, but um, the House of Rothschild owns Israel. The House of Rothschild owns America. It owns Australia. It owns New Zealand. It owns the European Union. In fact, it created it. Um, and and uh, and, and uh, Israel is there for the Rothschilds to uh, use as a way of creating massive conflict in the Middle East. Um, and you go into you Israel. Sorry, you go into Israel quite in depth in your latest book, I do. and I think it's one of the most important chapters in the book because if people can see, really, really see what's happening there, then their eyes will be opened. I think to the bigger picture, but if they can see that, that alone to start with. Um, well, the, the, yeah, the, the, the point is about all this, and this is, this is so important to, to get across. 
What the House of Rothschild has done, you see, I don't call Zionism Zionism, I call Zionism Rothschild Zionism to constantly underpin uh, um, the, the real creators and the real controllers of it, because it's not about Jewish people. I mean, no. the Rothschilds couldn't give a damn about Jewish people. They, 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 they hung hung them out to dry in in the Second World War in Germany. They're doing the same in Israel now. Um, to them, Jewish people are just fodder. They're just a smokescreen to use and hide behind. But what they've done, uh, the Rothschilds, through all this uh, media uh, control that we've been talking about, is they have equated, again, merely through repetition, that as with democracy and freedom, um, so with um, Zionism and Jewish people, that the two terms are interchangeable. One means the other. It does not. Mm. Um, what people don't realize is very, very large uh, numbers of people, uh, who Jew Jewish people, actually not only don't support Rothschild Zionism, but vehemently oppose it. Um, and uh, delegations of these people have been to Iran to meet uh, Ahmadinejad uh, and, and say, you know, the, the, the Zionists are not speaking for us. Um, you, you've now got, at one point recently, something like 300,000 Jewish people on, on the streets of Israel um, uh, protesting against uh, the way the government is treating them. And, and what we need to happen, this is so important, is the... Those that are controlling the Arab countries, uh, not least the, the oil royals, the fake sheikhs, I mean, uh, you know, a sheikh, he's royal. What does sheikh mean? It just means wise person or old el um, um, elder of the tribe. That's all it means. Nothing royal about it, but they've made it sound like that because they're not royals. They're just, they're just uh, uh, people that are, uh, are, are taking the country's resources for themselves uh, and, and uh, calling themselves uh, royal to justify it. But if people in the Arab world, the, the, the people in general, would realize that their empathy um, shouldn't be with uh, the, the leaders of the Arab world, it should be with, the, with, with Israelis. It should be the rank and file Israelis and Jewish people because the same force that is controlling the oil royals and these other um, uh, tyrannies in these Arab countries and, and, and imposing that tyranny upon the people is the same force that's controlling uh, Netanyahu and whoever's in power in, in Israel to do the same on the Jewish people of Israel, the Israelis. We, you know, we talk about Israel's done this, Israel's done that. Well, those 300,000 people on the streets of, uh, uh, of Israel ain't, ain't going to have done that any more than, than the vast majority of people in Britain have, have invaded Iraq or uh, attacked Libya. It's this cabal that is doing it in the name of the people. And this is why rank and file, I say rank and file, we're all infinite consciousness, infinite awareness, but in the terms that are used, the, the general population in Australia and the general population in Israel, the general population in, um, in, in Egypt or wherever, um, need to come together and realize that we are um, all being manipulated, uh, oppressed, suppressed, and controlled by this same force. And then the key uh, element in any situation where the few, and they are a few, controlling the many, uh, falls, and that's uh, divide and rule. While we, what they've done in Libya, um, through um, people on the ground, uh, I mean, the idea that, that there weren't uh, military and uh, intelligence personnel on the ground in Libya from America, Britain, France, etc., is an insult to the intelligence. There's videos of them on YouTube, for goodness sake. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but what they've done in Libya is they've got one faction um, to fight another faction to, to, to uh, kill and maim each other to, so that those that have orchestrated that and orchestrated the NATO bombing uh, so that the, the side they wanted would, would turn out the victor. Um, the, the force that's created that mayhem, that, that slaughter, that savagery, has now taken their country over. Mm. You know, I mean, it came out last week that this National Transitional Council, it's not, I mean, first of all, they, these are hand-picked people, um, 
by by the uh, Americans and and and, and Europe. But um, there's uh, another organisation um, which is is has been set up by America. It's like a a transitional financial organisation, and that is what is controlling Libya and is funding the apparently spontaneous um, Transitional National Council. And uh, so <clears throat> we see the movie, which the media, of course, play, because, you know, I've said for years, you know, most mainstream journalists are nothing more than movie correspondents. That's all they are. They're, they're just telling you, they're giving you the background to a movie, um, which to hide what's really going on. And so um, through this uh, means... Um, they have got Libyan to fight Libyan, and now they're controlling the country. Uh, it was amazing. I, I, I talk about multitasking. <laughs> well, in the early days of this, uh, in effect, civil war, but it wasn't really a civil war, because the civil war side on the rebels were merely basically... Um, uh, actors in a in a in a movie, very deadly actors, a lot of them, um, for for what was being orchestrated by by NATO in the background. But um, during the early days, this group of rebels, which had no structure officially then at all, they managed multitasking, taking to extreme levels, to uh, be dodging the bullets and, and and the missiles, and take time out to create a new central bank of Libya and to do oil deals with Qatar. Um, uh, because a lot of the funding of the rebels and, and arming of the rebels came through Qatar. And, and so um, now we, uh, we even saw at that time, but now it's blatant, what um, Gaddafi, I don't have no brief for Gaddafi, but he did a lot of good things for, for Libya. Uh, and I don't agree at all with someone being uh, uh, an unelected dictator for 40 years. But a lot of good things were done by Gaddafi for, for, for Libyans that weren't happening before he took over. Um, and let's have a bit of balance here. But And, and, and the people behind um, the rebels, uh, some of them would make Gaddafi look like a buddy angel. Uh, some of the slaughter that's gone on on that side of, of, of uh, Gaddafi supporters. Um, but what Gaddafi did, because he was aware, like Chavez in Venezuela, of, of, of some of the way this works, and he had a central bank of Libya and a Libyan currency, which in effect, to a very, very large extent, was one step back from the global financial system that's controlled by people like the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers. And they wanted that pulled in. They wanted that absorbed, and that, that's what they're going to have now. And of course, the, what they also wanted was the biggest oil reserves, known oil reserves in Africa, which are in Libya, so that they have them now. And it's also interesting that over the last couple of years, a number of, a number of pointers have come my way. And indeed, people like Ron Paul in America, the uh, congressman, have actually asked questions about this now. That a lot of what is claimed to be um, gold reserves in the world um, are not gold reserves at all. It's tungsten um, with a coating of gold. Um, so where's all the real gold gone? And people like Gaddafi and um, Chavez in Venezuela are aware of this. And what, before the um, fighting broke out in Libya, um, Gaddafi was trying to get the um, African Union and African countries to have a, a currency based on gold, which um, he knew that a lot of the Western countries that se seem to have these reserves of gold, they're not gold at all. This is the reason, Lisa, I only saw it in, in the, about uh, 10 days ago, why, why, why uh, Hugo Chavez in um, uh, Libya has demanded that all, uh, not Libya, uh, Venezuela, has demanded that all Venezuelan gold that's held abroad in places like the city of London is physically, physically returned to Venezuela. And of course, the, 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 most of the gold is, is, is just certificates. That's all it is. Um, people say, oh, I've got all this gold. No, you've got a certificate that says you have. Doesn't mean you have. It's not, does it exist? Paper that's not worth two exactly. Cents. So what Chavez is doing is saying, I want my gold back, um, uh, or physically. Because he knows that he knows what's going on, and now they're running around like uh, you know headless chickens trying to find enough physical gold to to, to send to him. Um, uh, don't so you think that's just these... asking for trouble, though, for him? For him, isn't he just? Aren't they going to find an excuse to to take over Venezuela? 
Well, yes, absolutely they are. Um, um, they, um, th there was um, a, a man called Aaron Russo, um, who was a, a well-known film producer and television program producer in yes. um, America. Um, he uh, was producer of the Eddie Murphy series Trading Places, um, 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 apparently. And <clears throat> um, just before he died of cancer, um, just a few years ago, uh, Aaron... Um, went public on what he knew about this whole conspiracy I'm talking about uh, uh, because he said that a man called Nick Rockefeller who, who now operates out of China because you know the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds uh, uh, etc have m massive um, connections to China, they have their people there because when I talked about the Third World War it's just another movie um, uh, you know uh, Putin uh, is part of it. Uh, the the Chinese leadership is part of it. The American leadership is part of it. The European Union leadership is part of it. And the war um, is designed to change the face of of the world um, and to bring in what they want, which is a world government, world army, to stop this ever happening again. Problem, reaction, solution. A world currency uh, uh, and um, uh, a um, microchip population so on and so forth so at the, the, that level the, the the players in this planned third world war are all on the same side it's the people that that fight each other thinking they're on different sides anyway um so that's why nick rockefeller is based in china um anyway in this conversation um Aaron russo talked about rockefeller who was a friend of his up to this point um, tried to uh, uh, bring him in uh, to <coughs> an organization called the Council on Foreign Relations in America, which is the organization Rockefeller Rothschild controlled that um, dictates American foreign policy along with uh, Israel, i.e. the Rothschilds. And um, what uh, this Nick Rockefeller uh, uh, said to him when um, uh, Russo said, why... Well, you've got all the money in the world, you've got all the power in the world, why do you want more? And he said, well, the people have to be controlled, etc. He talked about the microchip population, where um, everyone was going to be microchipped so that they could uh, know where everyone was at any time. And he said, if you join us, he said to Aaron Russo, you'll have a chip that's got a special code and, and you won't be stopped like other people. Um, and uh, the, the microchip's got a much bigger agenda than just electronic tagging as well. And um, this Nick Rockefeller said to uh, Aaron Russo that he would, because this was before 9-11, he would see uh, this, this major event uh, in... Uh, in America, a terrorist event, and, and that he, the, the, you, you would see soldiers um, searching caves in Afghanistan for Osama bin Laden, but it would also all be a giant hoax. This is before, obviously, before 9-11. But he also mentioned Chavez, that um, they, were, they wanted to remove Chavez and, um, and uh, get rid of him. Uh, because, you know, that's what happens. When there are people in countries that are not shall we say, on script or on board, then you, you have to find ways to remove them and put your people in. Uh, and it's uh, maybe not a coincidence that, that Chavez has, has um, just been in hospital for quite a while with, with what seems to be quite a serious cancer um, uh, because you can target people in many different ways. Um, and see, the process of putting your people in, in power and putting your people in power in any political party in a so-called democracy that has any chance of forming a government uh, and removing through various means whether by uh, demonization and invasion or whether by manipulated people's revolution or or, or or just talking to them talking to them in terms of health this process has now brought us to a point Lisa where um, this network controls virtually every country in the world in terms of politics banking business and media You've been talking about this network since the early 90s and I guess I didn't come across your work until someone gave me a copy of The Biggest Secret. Right. And as well as being probably the biggest book I'd ever written, <laughs> read, I hope you don't mug it well, out. see the last one. I, I, still look at the la I still look at the last one. You and Maurice got off your knees and think, oh my God, yes, 355,000 words. <laughs> Um, I've had the hands-on healing, you see. I've had the hands-on healing and I've had the crystal therapy, but I've still got verbal diarrhea. I can't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing will shift it. Well, that book was life-changing because 
Well, for me anyway, I found that there was so much confirmation in there for stuff that I'd suspected about world events and, and the structure of, of society, as well as completely blowing my mind open, wide open, about just how big, how complex and how deep and possibly how old this rabbit hole really, really is. Um, did you have any idea when you were getting started that, that this is where you were going? No, I didn't. Um, uh, I've always been, all my life, very, very skeptical about authority. Skeptical about governments, skeptical about political parties, um, of, of whatever, ever, ever uh, shade we're talking about. Um, so that, that was a good starting point, really. Because what I uncovered was, some of it was shocking, but some of it was, as you've just said about yourself, it, it was like, yeah, I, I'm not surprised. It had to be something like this. Uh, and, uh, but, of course, where it's gone in terms of so many other areas that people would you know, think bizarre, that, that was, to say the least, um, Surprising and, 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 and shocking. <laughs> I, want to, I do uh, want to get to that too, but um. yeah. And 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 the thing is that uh, if you are an expert in the five sense level of this conspiracy, you're an expert in 9/11. You're an expert in manipulated wars, in banking scams, in political scams and manipulation. You, you're an expert in 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 the biotech conspiracy and 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 the pharmaceutical conspiracy you are still even so only walking around the outer rim of the rabbit hole that's how deep it goes yeah um, and and this is why it's so important that if you're gonna f really pursue this and find out what's really happening in the world you have to suspend all preconceived idea you have to get a blank sheet of paper in front of you um, you have to wipe clean all your previous beliefs and perceptions and say okay information is going to be my guide and I'm gonna go with the information because if you have a political belief um, a religious belief particularly religious belief um, and and uh, or any rigid non-fluid immovable um, perception of anything then you are going to start editing, censoring, or not going into areas where the information could um, undermine and put your belief systems into question. See, there are, there are many, many people in America who are doing great work um, exposing this conspiracy on the um, five, five cents level. Mm. Um, but they won't go into other areas that we need to understand to understand why the five sense level works as it does and how because they have Christian belief systems which if they go into these areas will will be under threat and thus um, they don't go there um, well I kept thinking I, while I was reading that book I, I kept wondering how is this guy still walking and talking because you name presidents prime ministers so-called you know captains of industry and leaders of the military the media medical and pharmaceutical organizations oh, you name them as satanists as child murderers as pedophiles and right. more which we'll get to um did you ever go through a process of doubting or fear about going public with all of this no, never, never. Um, see, what, what the, the way I work is um, I come across information and it's, it's come to me in the most synchronistic way over the last 21 years. There is some force handing me pieces in a puzzle. There's no question about that. I don't know what that force is uh, uh, in terms of you know, uh, the, the detail, but something's handing me pieces in the puzzle through something called synchronicity. And so... What happens is um, a new subject will come into my life, um, and from that moment, uh, information about that subject is coming at me from all angles. Um, and uh, then I, what I call, put it on the back burner, and I 
wait to see what happens. And more information will come. Sometimes it doesn't. And if not, I leave it alone. But if it does, and it normally does, then it keeps adding and it keeps adding. It keeps cross-referencing. It keeps cross-confirming. Maybe about a person, maybe about a situation, whatever. And there comes a point where that uh, tapestry of information is compelling enough to me to go public with it. And, and my criteria is simple. It is, um, is it true? That's my criteria. Is it true or does the evidence that I've seen make it almost certain that it's true, as near as I can get? Yes, well, I'm going to start talking about it then publicly. Um, and consequences for me, they never enter the equation, um, you know, because... Um, this is how all this stuff has remained unknown for so long. People who do know are frightened of talking about it. Uh, and also there's the other thing that some, of, some elements of it are so fantastic compared with the world that we're told we're living in that people won't go there because their mind can't open enough to encompass the fact that it's possible, possibly uh, happening. But uh, certainly, uh, and I'll talk about this in the talks in Australia, because um, I'm going to be talking for about nine hours during during the day, because uh, what I do is connect dots, and so you have to talk about a dot, and then you have to connect it to the next dot, and so it takes time. It's not like, you know, presenting um, a version of, of, of the world that people are used to, so you can do it in a short time. You can't with this if you want to do it properly, because it's a completely different explanation of the world on every level, virtually. Um, <clears throat> but... I'll be talking about the connections between secret societies, Satanism, and pedophilia, uh, because they are connected. Now, I'm not saying that every Freemason is a Satanist or every Satanist is a pedophile. And I'm not saying that. But these rings do connect fundamentally. And again and again, I have found people in positions of power who have been all three. The... Um, uh, extent of paedophilia in the so-called upper cesspit levels of society is vastly greater than in uh, the population in general uh, for reasons I, I, I'll explain uh, in the talks. Um, there's a reason why that is the case and um, also the, the secret societies connect into Satanism. See these bloodlines that come out of the ancient world they're doing nothing now that they weren't in terms of Satanism that they weren't doing thousands of years ago. Uh, the difference is that thousands of years ago they could sacrifice people openly because it was acceptable. Now they can't. They have to do it in, in secret, covertly. Um, and they have a whole uh, network of uh, um, uh, organizations that, that allow them to do that and not be um, and not be exposed for it. Uh, it, except by people like 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 me, and it, actually talking of, of of Australia, you know, Australia <clears throat> is one of the uh, great satanic uh, centres of the world uh, in terms of the uh, the Satanist operation, um, and uh, you know, the, the, Australia has a certain energy. It, it almost certainly is a great landmass of the former so-called Lemuria or Mu from way back. A lot of it crashed into the sea and great devastation. There's a particular energy about Australia and, and they want that energy. And, and so the Satanists are trawling that energy and working with that, that, that energy. And um, just before the last book came out, literally as it was going to press, um, Human Race Got Off Your Knees, um, this document emerged in Australia of um, I wouldn't say it was a deathbed confession because the guy agreed with it but it was a an explanation by an alleged um, high Australian Satanist from the Sydney Lodge they call it the Alpha Lodge um, and uh, he was explaining how Satanists and Satanism runs the world how it controls politics how it controls Australian politics how it uh, pulls uh, politicians into paedophilia if they weren't in it already um, and therefore once they uh, they are uh, of course a, a 
partaken in that sickness, uh, then the, the, they do whatever the Satanists tell them, because otherwise it's going to be exposed. Um, there, there are I've talked at, at length to to people who've uh, investigated Satanism in Australia, and and you know there there are television presenters that are very very well known over there, and have been around for a long time, who are uh, practicing Satanists and and politicians. Goodness me, uh, galore, um, and one of the one of the quotes um, from this document, and I can't obviously uh, uh, prove that it's it's uh, uh, genuine. What I can say after 21 years of researching this stuff, that whoever bloody wrote it has a major, major understanding of Satanism and how it works. And he, he, he part of the quote in this, it was a long document. What I did was um, I put it in the in the back of the book as an appendix in full, the whole thing, and. Uh, what he said at one point is this, politicians <clears throat> are introduced to paedophilia by a carefully graded set of criteria and situations that enable them to accept that their victims will be, quote, our little secret. Young children sexually molested and physically abused by politicians worldwide are quickly used as sacrifices. In Australia, the bodies are hardly ever discovered, for Australia is still a wilderness. <clears throat> this is what's happening all over the world, and I, I, I found it all over the world, and there are um, every now and again tips of the iceberg that come to light, like um, what happened in Belgium in the Dutro case, where um, children were murdered by Dutro, and, and it was found that he was a procurer of children uh, for paedophilia, and the um, they call them uh, judges in um, in Belgium, the investigating judge who got on the case immediately that the story broke, um, started uncovering, as he, anyone genuinely investigating would, that this whole paedophile ring and procurement of children for paedophilia went into the highest or lowest echelons of Belgian society. And, and Belgium is a particularly important place in terms of paedophilia um, because so many people in the upper echelons um, of the system are paedophiles. And what you have in Belgium, of course, is the home of the European Union, the European Commission, and it's the home of NATO. And so you've got people from all over Europe and all over the world, from these uh, levels where the, the paedophilia is rife, who are in Belgium. And so as a result, there is this insatiable demand for uh, children to be sexually abused. That's why you know it, it, it's so prevalent there. In fact, um, I have seen... Um, a document um, in the Madeleine McCann case. You know this little girl that went missing uh, in uh, from Portugal on holiday. Yes. Um, and and has never been found. Um, and and this it was a uh, a document uh, relating to Leicestershire police. She she lived in <coughs> Leicestershire in England, saying that one line of inquiry was that um, forces, shall we say, paedophilia. Uh, network in Belgium um, had put the word out that they wanted a particular type of child um, and someone had seen Madeleine McCann in Portugal and made the call and said taken a picture covertly um, and um, sent it to Belgium they said yes she'll do basically and, and she, she was then taken and um, I've known for, oh God, best part of two decades that um, children are um, picked by, uh, or they're chosen, some of them. I mean, some of them are just taken because they're children, but others are, are, are kidnapped by order for paedophile rings and certain paedophiles. And um, a, a lot of these people, uh, a lot of these children are blonde-haired and blue-eyed, which is a particular kind of genetics that these families want. Um, and uh, a lot of these kids end up in, in places like the, uh, the Middle East, where the oil royals um, um, keep them in captivity. Uh, so, uh, and, and I don't know if this is happening in, in Australia, but again, it's the blueprint, and it's happening everywhere else, like in Europe, in Britain, in America, that we now have, and it, it's obviously systematic, because how it's, um, how, how it's quickly it's come in, uh, we have this epidemic now 
I'll give you the British example of children being taken from loving parents by social services on the most outrageous and spurious excuses. And the family court system is totally secret. And they say this is to protect the children. It's not. It's to protect the system who are stealing children from loving parents. So much so that when um, social services come along, often with armed police, unbelievably, to take children from their families, um, the families are told that um, if they go public with the fact that this has happened, they'll go to jail for breaking the, the family court secrecy uh, uh, laws. And, and the uh, social services <coughs> have... Um, on-call psychologists to give them the verdict they want. Um, if they want to take a child, then they, they say, well, we think the mother, uh, for instance, is um, psychologically unequipped to, to look after the children. They, 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 the mother says, well, you know, I'll have, a, I'll have a psychological test. I'm fine. Well, they have a psychological test with the hand-picked psychologist on the social services payroll and of course the psychologist says what social services want them to say and the children are then taken away <clears throat> not even often uh, if there's multiple children in a family not even often um, given to um, a, a, a foster home or a, a, an adopted family uh, together but actually broken up this is what is happening about 10,000 children are taken from their families in Britain every year now and it's growing and of course anything in this country almost anything that um, is horrific and part of this whole agenda uh, invariably finds its way at some point to Tony Blair Tony Blair um, uh, uh, is one of the uh, has been one of the most active um, agents of this conspiracy um, for the last uh, what 15 years uh, and he introduced legislation and it's again it's happening around the world because it's a blueprint which demanded that social services meet uh, targets figures for the number of children they take from families every year no. how can you have a target when every case has to be taken on its merits the target is because they want to bring in, they want to, they want uh, children um, away from their their families, and you know this is a, a, a another point about how long this agenda is projected forward. Um, it, they, this is not organised by people sitting around the table deciding the next move. No. This is like a biorhythm chart. It's a script. It's an agenda that's projected decades and decades ahead, at least, and then some. And there was a man called Aldous Huxley who wrote a book published in 1932 called Brave New World. And Brave New World <coughs> um, was an apparently a novel um, which talked about a future society in which not only did parents uh, not have the children with them, they, they didn't even eventually give birth to children. It was all done uh, uh, scientifically, technologically. And um, he described a world where um, parents and, and children were no longer connected. He described a world where drugs was used to make uh, the, 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 the enslaved population, quote, love their servitude, uh, etc. And... Um, when people have said to me in the past, um, what's the agenda? What do they eventually want? I've said to them, read two books, um, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley and um, 1984 by uh, George Orwell. George Orwell um, is the one that wrote about the police state, about the surveillance, and of course about the perpetual war to keep the people in line. We now have that. It's called the War on Terror. Sure. When do you know a war on terrorism is finished? You don't. Um, um, and therefore it's a perpetual war. That's what we're seeing. Now, what's interesting, Lisa, is um, uh, f when I was writing my last book, I, I put together the connections between these two authors of, quote, novels. George Orwell, real name Eric Blair, 
<coughs> went to the elite Eton College where the royals go near Windsor Castle just on the outskirts of London and his French teacher was Aldous Huxley. Aldous Huxley introduced um, Orwell to the Fabian Society one of these uh, major secret societies between, within the web that operates out of London but of course as you well, well know has very very serious influence in America in uh, Australia mm -hmm. and um, I mean uh, what's the name uh, the uh, the Prime Minister uh, Gillard Julie uh, Gillard, Gillard and um, and Kevin uh, Rudd um, the previous uh, Prime Minister they're both Fabians and and the Fabian Society is massively influential in um, in Australian politics um, and, and Tony Blair is a Fabian um, the Fabian Society created the British Labour Party and still controls it to this day and 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 the same with the Australian version because the two are very connected um, and uh, if you um, go into the inner sanctum of these uh, seriously significant secret societies like the Fabians, then you have access to the projected agenda decades and decades ahead. And if you have access to that, you can write prophetic novels that turn out, as Brave New World and 1984 have done, to be extraordinarily accurate in the light of modern uh, events. This, and I actually have a question about this, because as you've pointed out in your books, that, that this agenda, you know, it wasn't thought up over a beer last Tuesday. It's been right. on the cards for, if not hundreds of years, potentially even thousands of years. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, the, we're talking about beings or individuals with the ability for long-term planning. Right. And, but what we're seeing now is what can only be called incredibly short-term and short-sighted uh, decisions. Um, environmentally at least, you know, um, this new fracking that's going on now. Uh, we're talking about something that is absolutely devastating and, compl and completely irreparable on the environment. Why? I, this is something I can't make sense of because these, if, if these groups, if this agenda has been so long in the planning, why are we getting now to a point where they seem so short-sighted because they do if they want to create this paradise for themselves mm. why are they killing their potential paradise well um you know to to to, to go into that means to talk for a, probably as long as we've already talked <laughs> um, uh, what if um the force that is behind this in the realms of the unseen um, cannot enter this reality mm. for a number of reasons and one of them is the atmosphere of the planet is uh, not see where you're going. what it needs to be um, okay I've, let's open um, it, let's open it up to that then because in the biggest secret you did go where most people don't want to go, where no research had right. really gone before, because right. most researchers stop at the top of what they consider the, or what is the visible pyramid. They stop with families like the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and members of the Trilateral Commission and the Bilderberg Group and the CFR and all of these right. global secret societies. But you went beyond that to the people who are controlling and pulling their strings only to announce that in fact they're not people at all they're reptilian aliens operating from another dimension and I have to say when you first went there even though you had me right up to that point I thought you had gone off the deep end right. <laughs> um, and I know many others did too and I had to do what you did which was put it on the in the sort of the too hard for now basket yeah and and sit it out for a bit um, but Speaking for myself, 
it is only when you bring in the interdimensional aspect of this, of this whole control structure, once you can get your head around it, that it actually all comes together and makes sense. Yeah, because that what you're talking about is the common theme. You know, in the early days, people would say to me, when I was um, uncovering and publishing the information about the historical story, about how these bloodlines have worked through the thousands of years, uh, the question was why would someone dedicate their life to advancing this agenda in 1700 or 1600 when they knew they weren't going to be around for it to happen? Well, so there has to be a common theme, and the common theme is what, what we're talking about. And these um, people that come and go are people coming and going in our timeline, in our reality. So someone who was here manipulating uh, in 1600 will... Uh, pro probably now be here manipulating uh, behind another, you know, body shield um, uh, in another, uh, under another name uh, in 2011. So it, it's like they nip into this timeline, nip out at what we call death, nip back again, because we're consciousness, you know, the body's just the vehicle that, that allows us to interact with a tiny range of frequencies that we call the, the world. Um, and it does suddenly start to make sense because, you know, when um, you look around the ancient world, uh, the the talk and the accounts of um, serpent gods um, or, or snake gods is just enormous. It, it's uh, so far been found to be the oldest form of religious worship, serpent worship, which goes back at least 70,000 years into Africa. Um, and uh, the whole uh, kind of ancient world uh, was was talking about this stuff and the serpent gods. Uh, the ancient uh, Chinese emperors used to claim the right to be emperor because of their genetic connection to the serpent gods, and and so so it was in in Asia and and Africa and all over. And what we're looking at is this basically. There is a a group um, of non-human entities which take a reptilian form. Some of them take another other forms as well, but the, the reptilian one seems to be the dominant one. And they operate um, outside of what we call visible light or the electromagnetic spectrum, where um, humans uh, either directly through invisible light or indirectly through technology can can see into those 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 realms of reality but they're just a frequency range this world is like a television station a holographic television station or radio station um, radio stations share the same space as each other but they don't interfere with each other unless they're very very close on the dial because their frequencies don't connect therefore they share the same space but they're completely oblivious of each other and when you're listening to radio one uh, your tune your radio is tuned to radio one then you move the dial to radio two now you're getting radio two but radio one doesn't cease to broadcast when you move the dial from it it still exists it's still broadcasting you're not tuned to it anymore and these um, vehicles we call bodies um, are vehicles that allow us to interact with this frequency range because our consciousness the eternal self that which people are experiencing at near-death experiences um, they uh, are, um, th th or the, our consciousness is vibrating so fast that I couldn't sit on this chair or hold this pen or interact with this computer um, with my consciousness um, alone because the, the, the frequency difference would be too great. So I take on, like all of us, this vehicle, which is an outer shell, uh, like I call it sometimes a genetic spacesuit, which um, is resonating within the frequency range we want to interact with. Therefore, I can hold this pen, sit on this chair, and move this mouse. Um, and what we are looking at in terms of these bloodlines, which have incessantly and obsessively interbred all this time. You know, we talk about blue bloods. We talk about the, you know, keeping the genes up and the elite, the elite bloodlines and the royal bloodlines and all the rest of it. What does that mean? Why 
where where is the origin that certain bloodlines have the right to rule, the divine right to rule, as they said about royalty and stuff. We have a head of state. You have a head of state. Uh, come to that. Uh, 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 about two hours from where I'm sitting in Buckingham Palace, who is only head of state of Britain and Australia and New Zealand because of a uh, bloodline. She had a different bloodline. She might be cleaning the throne, not sitting on it. Ludicrous. So where does this come from? Where did the These original... Where did this bloodline yeah. originate? These, these bloodlines are hybrids. We all have a massive amount of reptilian genetics. There's a part of the brain called the R complex or the reptilian brain, which I'll talk about in Australia because it's very, very important to understand this in terms of human behavior and, and the control. Uh, but these bloodlines, and, and this is talked about in all, virtually all these ancient accounts of the interbreeding between the gods, the serpent gods and humans, creating this hybrid bloodline. And when um, we look at genetics, um, this is why I've had to research so many different subjects, not, in, not least the true nature of reality and this so-called physical world that isn't. Um, to understand what's going on. We look at genetics, um, we look at a wall, I don't know, we look at a person, we look at a bus, and we see something that's taking apparently physical form. But what it is, is an energetic information field. Um, and we read that, we decode that information into what we see as a physical um, object. Actually, it's a holographic object, illusory physical. So you look at genetics, you look at DNA, you look at the genetic structure of the body, and um, we perceive a physical body. Actually, it is an information field. I explain this all so simply in the talks in Australia. Um, and therefore, these entities that are manipulating, they understand that the human body is an information field and they um, have created these hybrid bloodlines which have a greater infusion of reptilian genetics than the, the, the mass of humanity. Um, and the, they have basically dual coded DNA. Part is human, one, and the other part is, is reptilian. When the human codes are open, their hologram projects as human. When their uh, reptilian codes are open, their uh, hologram projects as, um, as, as reptilian. And these bloodlines, because they have a greater infusion of reptilian genetics, i.e., the information field, the resonant vibrational field, then there is a far, far greater compatibility in terms of resonance and um, uh, um, vibration between the hybrid bloodlines and these reptilian uh, entities operating just beyond human sight than there is between the reptilians and the general human population. In other words, this vibrational compati compatibility between the two allows these hybrid bloodlines within uh, the human world to be possessed mentally, emotionally, and quote, physically far, far more powerfully than the general run of the population where that vibrational compatibility is nothing like the same. And so these reptilian entities have been manipulating our world for thousands of years and then some um, by hiding behind apparently human form. And if, if, this is a, a very simple analogy that kind of gives the relationship of everything. <clears throat> you, you'll see sometimes scientists working with material that's too dangerous to touch. <clears throat> Sorry. So, so the, um, the material is put in a tank. The scientist stands outside of the tank and um, puts on these big long gloves that allow the hands to go inside the tank and works with the material inside um, in a safe way. Take the tank to be our human reality, take the scientists to be the reptilian entities, and take the gloves to be these bloodlines, and you've got the relationship. And so these bloodlines have had to, over thousands and thousands of years, 
they've had to obsessively interbreed because they are they are in their terms um, perpetuating an information field which if they interbred with the general human population would be diluted very very quickly and um, therefore this is where you get all the interbreeding among the aristocracy and the royal families and also the unspoken aristocracy and royal families that now uh, overwhelmingly wear dark suits and operate in politics, business, banking and, and media, etc. Um, and so <clears throat> we see um, a, apparently a, a someone human uh, in the presidency but or, or running this bank or whatever, but actually if you could see uh, deeper into their energy field beyond the limitations of visible light and uh, and technology you would see um, a very di very different entity to the one that you th that, that that appears to be in power you know baby baby boy bush must have um, changed puppet masters over the years because I saw a, a YouTube clip of him recently in his days when he was uh, running for office <laughs> in Texas and it was a clip of him during a debate and in the overall scheme of things not that long ago um, but he was articulate he appeared quite intelligent well informed he didn't um ah uh, ask for the question to be repeated he didn't stumble he didn't you would not believe it was the same man as the one that was president Mm. Well, the thing is that um, these people are vehicles, and um, this the possessing entity or entities. Um, sometimes they come forward, and sometimes they stay in the background when there's no need for them to influence events, um, as there are at other times. And this this imposition or stepping back will. Uh, produce a very tangible change in the person's demeanor and personality definitely um, and uh, you know I, I've talked to so many people around the world who've taken part in these rituals these satanic rituals where these entities can manifest because of the um, energy environment that is created it's like a stepping stone energy field that they create which allows um, uh, these entities to move through into these rituals um, and uh, th I have had very world famous people describe to me including the British royal family what they get up to in these rituals and, and what happens in these rituals and if you could see um, the Queen in the rituals and um, as against the Queen you see in the public eye you wouldn't believe it was the same person uh, it's, it's they're just not the same you know it's like um, this schizophrenia where there I mean th there was a, a a woman who went on the Oprah Winfrey show a few years ago and um, talked about her life in a satanic family in Chicago and um, she was saying that uh, the family a uh, mother etc they were pillars of Chicago society um, and every, no, no one would ever suspect what they did because um, she said um, what they were like during the day and what they were like at night was totally completely different she said worse the effect of um, during the day um, these things were good these things were bad during the night it switched the things that were good during the day were bad during the night and were bad during the day personality were good at night you know in other words they seem to have all these moral values during the day and then at night absolutely the opposite happened there is a massive personality switch and that's when the reptilian entity or the possessing entity really imposes itself upon the uh, hybrid uh, vehicle uh, it, it obviously does that out of public sight because if it did it in public sight then we'd see what was going on so it's uh, you know it, they, they talk about people like Obama and Blair and Bill Clinton as consummate actors well they are they are acting they're acting a part 
And if you could see them outside of the public eye, well, you would have one hell of a shock mm. at what they really are compared with the public persona. But one of the things that comes through from the reptilian personality through the hybrid is lack of empathy. Um, this is a fail-safe mechanism of human behavior. If you have empathy, if you can feel or have empathy with the consequences for others of your actions, like abusing a little little child, then obviously you don't do it, and you don't want to do it. Um, but you take empathy out of the equation, delete empathy from the personality, and there are no limits now, because you have no emotional consequences for whatever you do. And that's why... Um, uh, they can kill 3,000 people on 9-11 and that's why they can pepper bomb Baghdad and kill a million and maim a million people. That's what they can do in, in Libya, uh, bombing whole cities of civilians while saying they're protecting them. They have no empathy um, and thus uh, no limits to what they will do. Um, but they have to appear to have empathy uh, in the public eye, otherwise they'd never get uh, anywhere near uh, power or public acceptance. And this is why you see Obama and, of course, the, 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 the big daddy of this, Tony Blair, with their extraordinary levels of fake empathy, their fake morality. They have to act it because they haven't got it. You know, Obama is a cold, cold man, just like Blair is, just like Clinton, just like Father George Bush, just like um, uh, Julia Gillard, very cold woman. The, the first time I saw Julia Gillard, I'm not, you know, just saying this, my blood ran cold <laughs> at seeing her. The energy that comes off that woman is unbelievable. But you don't have to um, have her coming over your television. We, we turn her off immediately. Ah! Oh, oh, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's so blatant. Um, um, uh, but, you know, I, uh, I have at least got into the country. Uh, they took a long time to agree to my visa, mine. Um, mm -hmm. to, to come into Australia because they, they'd rather me not be there, that's for sure. I'm the sure. last time I came to Australia, you know, when I, when, I, um, when I spoke in Melbourne, I got stopped at uh, immigration and I got, came in. I got taken into this room which was it, it, it was, it was something like that room in the Matrix. It was just brilliant white, you know, and this, this lady in uniform put this letter before me and I had to ask me to sign it to just confirm that I'd read it. And it said that... Um, I must not cause discord in Australia while I'm there. Um, and I'm thinking, well, that, that's that's done for a, a, you know every politician in Canberra, then, isn't it? You know, they cause discord every bloody day. Um, but uh, the idea that you know you don't cause discord. If you look at the dictionary um, definition of discord, it means you never say anything. Mm. Um, and this time when I, I asked for a visa, they um, they took uh, some time, they, they said it's being um, uh, sent to the government for uh, basically um, discussion and uh, they took some time to, to agree to it but they did and of course they had to win, they always have to win, they said yeah you can come in but you can't come in multiple times, you can only come in once, so there. I thought well I don't want to come in once mate, no it's no problem. But. Um, um, I think the decision they made uh, was, or, or the, the the kind of the, the thinking behind it was, it would it would give me more credence if they banned me than if they let me in. Yeah, well, exactly. So I think, and so I think they they let me in, but um, they are let me in, but um, for that reason, but they'd rather I not be there. And it's interesting, you know, to me um, when I travel a around the world. Um, and see these different countries. The the the, the quite we're well, not really unbelievable because it's the blueprint. But the way Australia's government works and the way the Canadian government works, they're mirrors of each other. They really are. They're, of course, they've both got the Queen as the head of state, and they've got the Governor Bloody General. This, the blueprints there, so you would expect that. But it is because um, I can't speak in Canada. They won't let me in. Um, I was just going to ask you that. Is there anywhere that they won't let you in? Yeah, Canada. Yeah, Canada. There's been a big campaign there uh, from government um, 
assets, shall we say, to stop me getting in. Um, and um, I, I even went in, went in for a legal case, um, uh, and they stopped me there. And I said, look, I don't really want to be involved here. I said, throw me out the country. I'd be happy to go home. But you just have to explain it to the judge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, well, we better let you in then. So I, got, I can get in for that. Uh, but I can't get, can't get in to speak. And and you have this situation where these governments, like Gillard and 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 the Canadian government, they unbelievably manage to speak the words without choking that they that, that their countries are free and it's a free country and we're part of the free world. Um, when their tyrannies, <laughs> you know, and it doesn't matter if it's Howard, it doesn't matter if it's Gillard, they're just masks on the same face, just as, you know, when the regimes apparently change in Canada, it's the same agenda uh, unfolds. Um, well, and, I'll have to you send know. you a copy, if you haven't heard already, of a letter that most families in Australia received over the last couple of weeks about having our children assessed um, with a GP. In order, to, this is children who are, who are getting ready to start school. Have you Here heard about we this go. One? <laughs> no, I've not. Can you send that to me. I will. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that well, that that fits again. I mean, we're, we're talking a key word here, children. Mm. And I tell I tell you, parents of Australia, and I, I say this to everybody because it's the same everywhere. You know, backsides and sofas need to part company very very fast because they want your children. And, and 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 if you've got grandchildren, well, they wa they'll want them even more uh, powerfully because of the way that they will have moved forward by then. Come on, enough, no more, because we we're going to bloody regret it deeply if we don't make a stand now, and not just stop it going any further, but start rolling it back. Uh, and um, if anyone says, uh, "Oh no, uh, I, I, can't, I can't be bothered," it's a good game. Are we lucky children in the eye, mate? Look your bloody grandchildren in the eye and tell them you, you've got no time. Or there's a good game on, you know. And it's interesting with with with, um, um, with this whole thing about the hidden hand uh, being in control and, and politicians just being puppets. Uh, and it's in our face. If people just take a deep breath, take a step back, and look at it again, you have an underground operation in in Australia called Pine Gap, mm. right? Right, the Pine Gap. It's not a million miles in Australia terms, of course, from from Ayers Rock. The, 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 they again, they working with this energy. They understand this energy because it's information, and and you can you can use this 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 the, the natural energetic fields of the earth in very very powerful ways if you know what you're doing. Um, and no uh, prime minister of Australia, whether it's Howard or Gillard or whoever will have a clue what is happening in Pine Gap, which is uh, uh, American soil in Australia. The um, British Prime Minister, uh, Cameron, Blair, doesn't matter who it is, will not have a clue what is happening uh, in uh, North Yorkshire, a place called Menwith Hill, which is a major uh, American base and is officially, once you get inside into the inner sanctum, American soil in Britain. Obama, Bush, Clinton will have not a clue what is happening in Pine Gap or Menwith Hill or in the uh, more than a hundred, considerably more than a hundred underground bases in America. So, <clears throat> next question. Who is controlling what's going on in those underground facilities no matter who's been voted or scammed into power politically because um, it was going on when Howard was in power was going on when uh, now Gillard's in power it was going on when Rudd's in power what was going on in Pine Gap and American underground bases was going on when Clinton was in power and Father Bush and Reagan and Carter just as it is with Obama, this is who who's running that? Who's who's just making the decisions about what goes on there? The presence I've got a clue. Uh, I mean, it's blatantly uh, uh, there, there, there's your hidden hand on that level alone that that is in power, no matter who's in government. Mm. Yeah, and you you go into this, you know, beautifully in your latest book, um, <laughs> which is such a subtle title: "Human Race, Get Off Your Knees." Uh, the lion sleeps no more. 
and this is another another time where you've you've come into my life at just the right moment because this book turned up at the end of what was a very intense 12 month period for me of research and you know soul searching and personal insights that involved virtually every topic you covered in this book it was quite bizarre i felt like we'd been on parallel journeys because after after 12 months of this I got to a point where I'd made some very definite decisions or come to some very definite conclusions about things, even though some of them I thought were quite bizarre, but it felt very true. And I was, I don't know, I guess I was asking for some form of confirmation. And then your book <laughs> shows up and I thought, great, there's another lunatic in the asylum, I'm not alone. Um, right. You covered everything, everything from the moon um, reincarnation, harp, chemtrails, straw man, you know, ayahuasca, you know, even the, the little things that were just sort of flyaway comments turned out to be something that was part of my research in the previous 12 months. It was extraordinary. What set you off down the path of the moon? Because it's, it's such a huge theme in that book. Well, um, the usual theme. I, I sat in my chair one morning when I was writing the book and, um, I got this very powerful, not quite voice, but very powerful thought passed through my mind out of nowhere, which said, was the effect of the moon's not what you think it is, the moon's not real. Um, and I, you know, I, I had been, I'd been looking at the moon on the quiet for a few years, actually, thinking it doesn't make sense to me, but it, it just came to me that morning. And most people would just dismiss that and carry on with their lives, but because I've become aware of a sequence that has come in my life over and over and over again um, of some powerful thought introducing a subject and then suddenly five sense information experiences documents books whatever uh, coming to me on that subject very soon afterwards um, uh, when this happened that morning I thought well okay I'm gonna go with this and so I put a few words in search engine um, relating to the moon's not real and up came a book called who built the moon um, by two researchers who were looking at the extraordinary uh, coincidences quote um, and mathematical connections between the moon the earth and the sun um, and um, I read that book, it made total sense to me, and, and that was the start of a, a sequence of events where um, information was coming about that subject from, from all directions, and I, I just fitted the information together. Did you and, come across um, um, a book called Penetration by Ingo Swan? No. No, no, not come across that one, no. Okay, that was one of the ones that but, I started with. All right. No, I, I, it, it's always started like that. I mean, the reptilian thing started like that. Um, started getting um, a few inclinations about this reptilian thing, and uh, you know, put it on the back burner. But then, you know, I was traveling America in the sort of mid nineties, uh, mid late nineties, and uh, I met twelve different people in fifteen days um, in different places around America who told me the same thing about they'd had experiences of seeing people appear human then shift into a reptilian form and back again and uh, they were from all different walks of life and backgrounds told me the same thing so that's that's why I say there is some there is some force that's been uh, what it's felt like over the last um, 21 years since I, I started to consciously wake up to this um, it's like I'm walking through a maze and some force is opening and closing doors so that I go down the right channels to find out the right things where without that synchronistic guidance if you like I would not have uh, I, I, I might have been on book two by now <laughs> <laughs> um, because um, the synchronicity has been unbelievable. The synchronicity while I was writing my new book coming out in, um, in, in January this summer has been remarkable again. There is a force that is, is trying to um, let humanity know what its plight is. Um, and it's very clear that that's the case. But to, to hear that force 
you have to open your mind to consciousness because mind body is a very low level of awareness and if you um, only operate on mind body you're only basically going to be aware of the five sense reality and and given that five sense reality has been stitched up in terms of information by by this cabal basically you're the information that you're receiving to give you a fix on the world and yourself um, is from those that wish to enslave you when you open your mind to consciousness that the, the 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 higher levels of self the eternal levels of self then you get insights from beyond this reality about this reality um, it's like instead of um, you know standing there staring at, at, at a brick um, you're on top of the hill and you can see that the brick is part of a house and the house is part of a road and the road is part of a town and the town is part of a country you get this much greater perspective of what you are actually experiencing in daily reality when you have this point that you can move your point of attention to a level of awareness that can see beyond this world then you see how everything connects you know, like, you know, use the brick analogy. If you're standing there staring uh, at close range at a brick and someone says, what is it? They, they, they wouldn't be able to explain to you what it is because they wouldn't know. But if they take a few steps back, they'll say, oh, yeah, it's a brick in a house or a brick in a wall. Um, uh, it's all about point of attention. And when you um, get caught in mind, body, awareness alone, of course, we have to interact with that while we interact with this reality but when it we, we become so focused on mind body level of awareness the five senses then basically we are um, we are we are just disconnected from home really uh, we are in this world and of it and therefore the information within this world is all we have to get a fix on what this world is and what we are and where we are and what the hell's going on <laughs> and of course that 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 information source is controlled by the global cabal but when you um when you open your mind uh, beyond that and you 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 move your point of attention into uh that your greater consciousness you're in this world uh, physically illusory physically but you're not of this world in terms of your point of attention so you're seeing things that other people don't see and thus people who are in this world and of it look at you and what you say and they go you're crazy um, and what it it's not about being crazy or not crazy it's not even about being right or wrong it's being able to decode information of a certain type and being able to decode information of a much more expanded type which, which is uh, uh, vibrating uh, much quicker than mind body therefore mind body can't access it only consciousness can uh, that's the difference it's a difference of perception and you know <clears throat> so the same awareness um, can look through the same eyes at the same world and they can see it completely differently depending on where their point of attention their point of observation is of that world so and is what is happening sorry this is where you've surprised me and many others because you know you started out as a researcher on the Illuminati and now you're at the point where you're writing and talking about some of the most incredible and deep and exciting spiritual aspects of life you've become and I know that you do get labeled you know some sort of new age guru every now and then but <laughs> excuse me you know this is not the sort of information you expect from a from an Ill Illuminati researcher it's actually some no. of the most spiritual text I've ever read well it's interesting Lisa because uh, how did I start out? It's a long story. I had some incredible paranormal experiences. It's a very long story which started me out. But um, the the thing that made me really start questioning the world was when after I started to consciously awaken, because all the way through my, my life I'd rejected religion and I'd rejected this world is all there is science. I think that, you know, that, that, which is another religion. And, and um, 
but I'd not really looked at the alternative because you get on with your life as you do. Um, but when I started to awaken after 1990, I realized that there were, uh, not, not to the depth that I'm doing now, but there, there were explanations about life um, that made total sense to me. Um, and my question was, why isn't this taught in the schools? Why aren't there television programs about this? And I, you know, I, I, it was obvious to me that this information was being suppressed on purpose. So why? And that then you start the steps. Hmm. So that's how I can, really came into this, was why is this spiritual information not available? Um, and, uh, of course, then I went through the whole five cents level of the conspiracy as you've talked about and I still do it's important we know about that I mean my website covers that every day um, but you can't understand <clears throat> what's happening in this world you start can't understand particularly what we can do about it unless we understand at least the basics of the nature of reality and who we are because um, the foundation of the uh, the conspiracy is to keep humanity in ignorance of its true self and to keep us in ignorance of the true nature of the reality we're experiencing. Uh, they know that we're decoding reality and therefore they uh, uh, target our decoding system, mind-body, to decode reality in the way that suits their agenda. What we, uh, what we believe, we perceive, and what we perceive, we experience. And so they're constantly um, seeking from cradle to grave to implant like a gigantic hypnotist perceptions of self and reality, belief systems, which will then decode reality according to the belief in exactly the same way as a hypnotist implants the belief that someone on the stage in a, in a hypnotist stage show is, is eating uh, an apple when they're actually eating a potato. But because of the implanted belief, the brain decodes through that program the taste of the potato when the electrical information reaches it from the taste buds, um, and the person thinks they're eating an apple when they're actually eating a potato. Well, this is humanity collectively. We're eating an apple uh, or eating a potato, and we think it's an apple. <laughs> um, it's the same principle. Um, and this is why when you go, this is why I say to people, I don't have any beliefs. I don't. I don't have any beliefs. All I have are the perception of what is at any moment. In the full knowledge, as Socrates is supposed to have said in ancient Greece, that wisdom is knowing how little we know. Um, and uh, knowing that there is always, always, always more to know. Mm. And therefore, I'm... Um, at any point, this is how I see it, but I know that next week and next month I'll see it uh, in a slightly different way or a more advanced way because of new information. It's no, there are no beliefs in there that are immovable, that are, um, you know, that repel all borders. There's just um, uh, the perception of how I see it at the time. Um, and, of course, that perception is based on information, research, and all the rest of it. But, you know, we're living in an infinite universe and an infinite infinity. And, therefore, there's always more to know. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, everything I need to know is in the, between the covers of this book. <laughs> all right. So the whole of the infinite universe, all that it is, has been, and ever can be, is between the covers of that book, written by who knows who, who knows when, and who knows what circumstances. Yeah. Right, but, you know, and a few can't control the world. It's a doddle. <laughs> well, you know, we've been talking now for two hours, and there is so much yes, that I have. didn't get a chance. I haven't, I haven't even touched on. So hopefully, that's why I talk for nine. <laughs> that's why I talk for nine. I need the time. You do. Well, hopefully, I don't know if you'll have the time, but when you come to Australia, maybe we can actually do this again because there's yeah, so much good. I'd love to ask. Um, yeah, great. But I would, I thoroughly want to recommend to people um, this newest book, and. They can get it at David's website, which is just davidike.com. Um, and I believe, you've, is it on Amazon as well? Um, I don't know. I, I have nothing to do with the, that side of it. I just write them and then and then, then write another one. <laughs> yeah, and 
other people do the rest and uh, I don't really get involved but um, certainly the, 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 one of the quickest ways you can get it is um, is through davidike.com because that's turned around immediately and um, also uh, you know I, I think they're available in bookshops in, in Australia here and there um, but um, I don't know you know much about that I'll find a lot, out a lot more when I when I when I get there very soon okay. but they're uh, they're certainly available in um, in shops all over the world um, and 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 for one simple reason demand for them um, because um, if there wasn't demand they wouldn't they would they certainly wouldn't want that kind of material in their shops but in, in the end you know it's like it's like with um, uh, sometimes in the media uh, I get onto radio stations for no other reason than the audience increases not because David Icke's on but because of the information and people's interest in it yeah. um, and uh, you know uh, pe people are getting more and more, more interested in it I mean when I started out in 1990 um, you know I couldn't couldn't fill a phone booth really uh, with this um, information uh, but 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 now you know um, all the tickets have gone for all the Australian events and they've just introduced another 500 for the Gold Coast event. I, I said to the organiser, what have you done? Got the builders in. Where do they come from? Um, I think I, there's I more available know. in Melbourne too, so if you want to go and see David Icke when he comes to Australia, you land on September 11, I believe. So I, I land on September 11, not by choice, but by just the way it turned <laughs> out. Yeah, and then, um, and then, and then off, off we go and it's going to be a, a very... Um, very, you know, physically challenging uh, period, but, but I'm sure a very spiritually um, uh, kind of inspiring uh, period, especially in that energy of Australia, which is the, the, the Satanists don't want that for no reason. They mm. want it because they know what it is. It's and you're also very going to New Zealand, yes? Particular, very powerful energy. Sorry again? Sorry, you're also going to New Zealand? Yeah, I'm going to Auckland, yeah. Um, I've, I've been to New Zealand about uh, twice, and... Um, uh, so often, you know, you, you go in, um, you get off the plane, you go to a hotel, uh, you speak the next day, and then you, you're on the plane out of there. So, mm. But this time, I'm going to actually stay there for, I think, a couple of weeks um, with a friend of mine and, um, and see some of uh, New Zealand, which I, I, I know from the little bit I've seen is a beautiful place. Um, just before I let you go, I wanted to ask you if you saw the movie Legends of the Guardian. No. Oh, you've got to see it. It's an Australian animation film about, All right. about owls. Let me write that down. Legends, Legends of the Guardian. Yes. It came okay. out in when I was doing... That's only not that old, so it was only a year or so. Um, but it's this story of owls and how one species of owl believe they are superior to all the other owls and they go around kidnapping predominantly young owls of the other species take them to their big cave and they uh, nominate you know which one is going to be a warrior the bigger owls tend to be turned into soldiers you know smaller ones are workers they get given allocated jobs and to control these owls they get them to look at the moon with mm. their eyes open and fall asleep looking at the moon and it's called moon blink they moon blink right. <laughs> and I was watching this going oh my lord somebody knows something because it was just extraordinary they get moon blinked and then they become these robotic you know zombie workers well that's go about that, their that, 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 that is fascinating because of course one of the one of the significant symbols that the these families use in their symbolic language which is massive is is the owl mm, yes. uh, uh, but uh, th that that is basically a, a, a really n good summary of the situation we're, we're facing and you know there's a number of these animated movies that have come out um, which have told the story basically there was um, a bug's life mm, and came out where the yeah where a few a few grasshoppers were controlling millions of ants through fear and intimidation, and um, the, the 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 way they did it, and, and the words spoken by the the leader grasshopper about what you need to do for the few to control the world were absolutely straight off the pages of Illuminati, um, uh, you know, mass mind control technical manual. Really, I mean, they, they, they do tell this story. It's um, and there's another one that just ants, uh, just called ants, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, that was another story of how 
millions of, of ants were being led to total destruction by a few leaders, you know. The tail's wagging the dog, that's the thing. And, you know, I, I, was, I was looking at it, because obviously now I turning my mind to Australia because nearly come in there because I like to research places um, as close to the time that I, I'm going as possible because then it's all fresh in my mind <clears throat> but I saw the Australian population is for 22 million according to um, what I saw this morning 22 million when you look <clears throat> at the resources of Australia um, and you've got a population of 22 million if those resources were shared out <coughs> even vaguely fairly then no one would want for anything in Australia no, no one would want for anything it's ridiculous the size of the country um, the resources of the country the population size of the country this should be a paradise same in, in Canada um, but it, it's, it's, it's not because the few hijack all the wealth and resources and the people doing that off are agents of this cabal and it's happening in every country mm. uh, and and you know Australia is a blatant example of it because the population is is so small in relation to its resources that you know anyone is hungry in Australia anyone doesn't have decent uh, 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 house in, in Australia you know anyone wants for anything in, in Australia is ridiculous in, in, a, in, a, in a society in which uh, a country is run for its citizens instead of its citizens being run for the people running the country well when you want to talk about want when you come here if you get the opportunity and you may do as you go to Alice Springs the yeah. conditions under which the original people of this country live <laughs> I mean want doesn't even come close and yeah, but you, you see, they, they they have to destroy those people. They, they have to. You, you you go into Africa, you go into any of these uh, countries where the West has taken over, and they target and marginalise and suppress the native peoples because they carry knowledge from the ancient world that is um, that uh, the controllers do not want the public to have access to. Have you heard of the card that has been issued to the indigenous population? that controls their money. Uh, which, what, what's that one? I can't think what it's called now, the blue card or the green card. Right. Um, their government payments, because for most of them there's no work available, they can't get a job. Many of them are living right. on government um, benefit. But now most of their right. government benefit is paid into a particular card. It looks like a credit card or a debit card. And that can only be spent at particular shops. And it can only be spent on particular items. And they're told that it's for their own good, which <laughs> always gets my back up, that it's to prevent them from spending their money on tobacco and alcohol and, and things. Um, then a very small proportion of it is actually given to them into their bank account in cash. Most of them live in these communities. Or the one that, that I'm aware of that, is, that I've spoken to, one of the elders there, um, the, her community is a several hours bus trip away from any shops. The only way to pay for the bus is in cash. The very little cash they get is enough to pay for the bus, <laughs> that which takes them then to the shops where they can buy specific things only. They cannot buy children's toys. They, can, they, they cannot buy for their own child a birthday or Christmas present. It's not on the list of approved items. Um, there's so much that's not on the list of approved items, it's not funny. Um, and that's how they're being controlled now. And that's only working at the moment in, in the Northern Territory, but they've just decided to bring it into uh, Redfern, I, th I believe, in Sydney. And well, I tell you, um, what you're describing is what they want to be the situation for everybody yes. in the brave new world. That this is the, this is this is the, the thin end of the wedge, the starting of the process. This is what they want to do to everybody. And this is where the quote that you talk about too. You mentioned in in the recent book that came out of um, the Nazi Germany about that first they came for. I can't remember the quote. At first they came for the Jews. Yeah, and I first wasn't they Jewish. came for the Jews, and I wasn't a Jew, so they didn't. I did nothing. Then they came for the. Tra 
communists and I was not a communist so I did nothing and they came for the trade unionists and I was not a trade unionist so I did nothing then they came for me and there was no one left to speak out for me yes uh, and that's it's something, something I think Australians need to be reminded of right now yeah it's something I emphasize a lot um, if you think that injustice for others is not your problem well eventually it will be because the knock will eventually come on your door because what they do and they're doing is picking off different sections of society demonizing them and then um, uh, when that's all sorted and people say well it's not my problem I don't like them anyway um, you don't have to like them mate but it's an injustice do you want to, do you have to uh, only challenge injustice and get people you like um, and, and anyway um, then oh god yeah <laughs> anything off and then um, we uh, have a situation where they go t to the next one and, and they do the same to them then they go to the next group they do the same to them and then eventually you reach the situation with the pastor that said those words in Nazi Germany then they came for me and there was no one left to speak out for me mm. and and at that point it's too late uh, and um, it's not too late yet but it's getting close we need to start moving very fast well one thing I did like about your book is that even though you know, we're talking about pretty heavy subject matter here. You do also show that there is a way out. There are solutions, and that I think is very, very important. There's enough people jumping up and down and screaming about what's wrong. We need to start talking about what's right and what can fix what's wrong. And you know, we need solutions. Yeah. So. Yeah, we do. And, and but I, I, you know, I'll, I'll be talking about that. The whole of the basically the last section of the four sections of my talk in Australia will be about that yes, good. and it's it's about removing it, it's not so much solutions it's removing the cause of the problem and the cause of the problem is us and um, we can cease therefore to be the cause of the problem that's that's the great news it, it is in our hands to a very large extent yes um, uh, because um, the power that's used to control us is the power we give away to those controlling us every day we take it back it's over um, but to do that first of all we've got to understand the true nature of who we are we've got to understand the power we have from that and we've got to let the fault lines of divide and rule go um, you know um, injustice against an aborigine is an injustice against me and I live I live I live in Britain uh, 13,000 miles away is it a long long way anyway um, it has to be like that because otherwise injustice is like a cancer it just grows and grows and grows and eventually hits you um, and and so we have to stand together and uh, like I, I think I said earlier about um, uh, Jewish people in in Israel standing together with um, Arab people in the uh, Arab countries um, because the the masters of the Arabs and the masters of the the Jewish people in Israel are just agents of the same force.